Please stand by. We're about to begin. Good day and welcome to the DISH Network, DISH Network Corporation Q4 and Year in 2018 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Jason Kaiser. Please go ahead, sir. Great. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I'm joined today by Charlie Ergen, our chairman, Tom Cullen, EVP of Corporate Development, Eric Carlson, our CEO, Brian Nalen, the president of DISH, Warren Schlichting, the president of Sling, Paul Orban, our chief accounting officer, and Tim Messner, our general mm-hmm. counsel. Um, before we get into Eric's uh, prepared remarks, we do need to do some safe harbor disclosures. So for that, we'll turn it over to Tim. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Statements we make during this call that are not statements of historical fact constitute forward-looking statements that are subject to risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause our actual results to differ materially from historical results and or from our forecasts. For more information, please refer to the risks, uncertainties, and other factors discussed in our SEC filings. All cautionary statements that we make during this call should be understood as being applicable to any forward-looking statements we make wherever they appear. You should carefully consider the risks, uncertainties, and other factors discussed in our SEC filings and should not place undue reliance on forward-looking statements, which we assume no responsibility for updating. As part of the process for the upcoming FCC Auction 102, we filed an application to potentially participate as a bidder for those Spectrum assets. Because of the FCC's rules, we are not able to discuss what, if any, Spectrum resources we may intend to bid on, and we will not be answering any questions about the auction on today's call. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our CEO, Eric Carlson. Well, thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Both Paul and I have a few opening remarks before we open it up to Q&A. On the wireless front, we're 388 days away from our March 7th, 2020 build-out deadline, and the deployment team is in full swing. Crews are working at knitting, staging, and installing gear on towers across the nation. A lot of work is ahead, but progress is definitely mounting, and Charlie and Tom are both here for questions on wireless. You know, over the past year, I've been fairly consistent on the theme of excellent customer experience as a strategy for DISH. Delivering the best in service, technology, and value has been a consistent goal. This is intentional. In a category as challenged as this one, this is a rational way for us to stand apart. Our internal metrics confirm our path. For the year, we reported 1.78% churn at DISH TV. That's the full picture, including Latino. If you're to look at just general market, we continue to deliver historic company lows for churn. Part and parcel of the customer experience is having the right customer, and you may have noticed we're a bit higher on SAC year over year. A couple of factors to consider. As uh, many of you know, we've been pursuing a strategy for finding the right customer in the right geography and delivering that household the right service, technology, and value that will deliver us a profitable long-term relationship for DISH. The emphasis has led to higher commissions at our independent retail channel and an increase in hardware costs as a higher percentage of our new customers are activating with higher price receivers like the Hopper 3 instead of some of our remanufactured gear. Now, another dimension is the SAC picture. In 2017, we had more low SAC Puerto Rico subscribers, those that were impacted by Hurricane Maria, reactivate as compared to 2018, which effectively lowered our DISH TV SAC during 2017. Let me touch on programming for just a moment, first on Univision. It's fair to conclude that we've been unable to achieve a reasonable deal for our customers, and at this point, customers who are heavy Univision viewers have likely found alternatives including our customers who installed off-air antennas and who are able to receive Univision programming at no cost. For our part, we expect the situation offers some advantages over the long term, especially as you introduce an OTA into the picture, and uh, we're able to charge less for Dish Latino uh, to our customers. With regard to HBO and AT&T, there hasn't been meaningful movement. HBO is demanding a contract that would have forced Dish customers to subsidize both HBO and Cinemax, even if customers chose not to subscribe to those services. So our view hasn't changed. AT&T's stance remains one of the fundamental negatives of their merger with Time Warner. Consistent with guidance I shared with you in the last call, it's fair to say that together, HBO and Univision account for a little bit more than half of our net sub loss in the quarter. Let me close out with a few observations on Sling. We're pleased that sub growth continues in the right direction and that we continue to lead the category in live OTT. I think that's the product of several points coming together. We continue to invest in platform stability. We found the customers are incredibly sensitive to performance. And the ad experience on Sling continues to improve. 
And by that, I mean we're delivering on DAI-driven advertising, programmatic, addressable, and cross-platform. That's great for us. That's great for the brands. And it creates an advertising environment that's better for customers. In fact, we've seen ad revenues on Sling grow threefold in the past year, and that's on top of the tenfold increase I shared with you on last February's call. We remain margin positive on every sub we bring into Sling, and that's reflective of a disciplined, dare I say, rational program that Warren and his team are running. We're offering the right content, the right add-ons like DBR, and with the right technical expertise on the mobile and fixed platforms that our customers love. We remain bullish on live OTT and the experience that the Sling, Sling team is shaping and delivering is really second to none. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who has a few brief remarks in the quarter, and then we'll open up to Q&A. Paul? Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Our core pay TV business made positive strides throughout 2018. Our DISH TV team continued to focus on acquiring and retaining high-quality subscribers with long-term profitability. Our Sling TV team added content and grew the subscriber base. Consistent with previous calls, I want to outline the impact of the new revenue recognition standard. This had a $154 million positive impact to both operating income and EBITDA for the full year. The benefit from this new standard will decrease over time as the deferred costs begin to build up. <clears throat> 2018 operating income and EBITDA were both higher year over year by $580 million and $368 million, respectively. Adjusted for one-time items such as RevRec rev and the impacts of the 2017 litigation expense and asset impairment, operating income would have been relatively flat, down $16 million year over year. EBITDA would have been down $228 million. In 2017, EBITDA benefited from $105 million of other income primarily related to gains on marketable investment securities. Free cash flow continues to be strong at $1.2 billion. Now for the P&L details. Revenue is down 5% year over year due to fewer Dish TV subscribers <laughs> and lower pay TV ARPU partially offset by the growth of the Sling subscriber base. Subscriber-related expenses decreased 4%, also as a result of fewer Dish TV subscribers. Our programming expenses were positively impacted by the Univision and HBO channel removals. Our variable expenses improved due to fewer subscribers and increased operational efficiencies. Our satellite and transmission expenses decreased $81 million, or 12%. Certain satellite leases expired and costs decreased in our digital broadcast operations. Our subscriber acquisition costs decreased $435 million, or 36%, largely due to fewer DISH TV activations and the impact of capitalizing certain commission costs under the new revenue accounting standard. As a reminder, substantially all of our interest expense is being capitalized while we are building out our network. Also, our effective tax rate is lower in 2018 due to the Federal Tax Reform Act. Additionally, related to our wireless network, it's important to note that because we are currently building that network, much of our spend related to the build-out is being capitalized, which you do not see in the P&L. Pay TV ARPU is down due to a higher percentage of Sling TV subscribers in the pay TV subscriber base. In addition, we had a decrease in revenue related to premium channels, including the impact of the HBO channel removal and pay-per-view boxing events. This decrease was partially offset by DISH TV programming price increases and increases in revenue per subscriber related to Sling TV. The Sling increase was mainly driven by the mix of customers taking higher price packages and add-on revenue, such as extras, cloud DVR, and ad sales. In addition, the impact of the $5 increase on our orange package began in the third quarter and was fully realized starting in the fourth quarter. With that, I'll turn it over for questions. Operator? Thank you. The question and answer session will be conducted electronically. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by the digit one. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. We will take questions from the analyst community first, then there will be an answer session for the media questions. Once again, if you're an analyst and would like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1 and we'll pause for just a moment. 
And our first question today will come from Philip Kusick with J.P. Morgan. Mr. Kusick, your line is open. Perhaps we should go to the next next caller. Okay. Next, next we'll move to Canon Vin Kateswar with Barclays. Thank you. Um, just a couple from me. First, on um, um, on the refinancing risk, um, Charlie. I guess there's a little bit of a language change in the 10K uh, in terms of um, uh, refinancing, and there's a risk that's been added there. Just wanted to understand, how are you thinking about the balance sheet and all the maturities that are coming up? Um, is there any difference in the way you're thinking about the balance sheet today versus maybe beginning of last year uh, in terms of maybe raising secured debt or something on those lines, um, especially as you go into the $10 billion phase of the build-out, um, the phase two of the build-out? And secondly, more from a, um, a core performance trend line perspective, as we go into um, the first couple of quarters uh, this year, should we see any change in trends given that the biggest impact of sub losses due to loss of carriage tends to happen close to uh, when the loss of content actually happens? Uh, should we expect that to moderate in the coming quarters? Thanks. Yeah, uh, can I, this is Jason. I'll take the first one on the, on the refinancing risk. I mean, you know, we, we continually monitor all of our um, capital markets options just, just like we always have. Um, there's, there's nothing really new there, and the, but the, the market got uh, tied up a little bit in the fourth quarter, and we keep our eye on that type of stuff all the time. Um, we're constantly evaluating um, what's available to us. I think we've got many alternatives that are available, both for refi or for fresh capital. Um, we've looked at things that are at the operating company. We've looked at things that are at the holding company. But I think right now we're pretty comfortable that there's there's not any urgent need to do anything. Um, you know, everybody's familiar with our with our maturity profile, and as we move out and get into some of the bigger maturities, we'll we'll continue to look at that and determine what's the best you know avenue to take. But we haven't made any determination on anything at this point. Eric, you want to take your the the, the programming question? Yeah, on uh, Ken, on the on the uh, on the carriage. Obviously, I think that um, you know you know normally you see a trend uh, very close to uh, the takedown of content. In this, in this particular case, there's a, there's a couple inflection points. On the Univision side, um, obviously we had a removal um, uh, midsummer, I think the end of January, uh, June. Sorry about that. And um, and then Deportes followed that in uh, November, uh, early November, along with uh, with HBO. So. Um, there's no doubt on the uh, you know on the Univision front, we are seeing uh, you know declining um, uh, customer attrition. However, I, I you know I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't give guidance that that uh, that 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 we're through all of the uh, all of the um, uh, customers leaving us on the HBO front. Obviously, um, you know HBO had an impact uh, along with Univision in the fourth quarter, and uh, you know I think HBO has uh, their Game of Thrones coming up in April. And um, obviously that, that, that could impact us if we're not able to reach an agreement. Yeah. And this is Charlie. I, I think what happens is it's always disappointing when you lose a long-term partner. And both Univision and HBO, particularly HBO, were, were long-term partners. But there's different dynamics there. HBO obviously was acquired by AT&T, and AT&T AT is taking a very anti-competitive approach to, to carriage because they view DISH potentially as, as one of their larger competitors. And so that that's an that's a, a strictly a – they've made a decision not to engage any kind of conversation that any, any, real, any company would realistically, realistically take. The downside for them is that, that customers love DISH and are, are um, uh, at least within the pay TV business, I think we're the high – at least most, most polls and most surveys show us as the most highly rated. So they like their DISH service. They like their hopper experience. And so – some customers do leave us because HBO is a very strong brand and has strong content, but some customers find that they they can live they that they can live without it, and, and then some customers still stay with Dish and love it, and they find another way to get HBO, and that means they go if they'll go to their friend's house for ten weeks during Game of Thrones, uh, or they there becomes an increased uh, uh, usage of uh, every young person knows how to go on the internet and get a code and watch HBO for free, um, and so you end up with a piracy issue that. Unfortunately, we prefer not to see, but 
when customers get something taken away, they resort to, to other means. So, um, and then we work with our other partners that have movies, which are very popular with our customers, and, and we see increased usage of that. It does affect our boo. Obviously, when we sell HBO for $15 and Cinemax for $10, you lose those subs, you, you lose ARPU there. So that's one of the conditions. So with Univision, they really had a, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of a perfect storm. They had a change in management who had, who I think the existing management would, 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 would say in private that, that unrealistic expectations of what they're trying to, to, to do DISH on a renewal deal. Um, so the management and DISH probably have a pretty good, actually have a pretty good relationship absent the inability to get to a deal. And the reason that we that we haven't been able to get to a deal is that the mo most our best customers who love Univision, and we have a lot of customers who love Univision. That they've left, they've left, or they put an offer antenna in to get the programming. So they've made adjustments to to to, to view Univision or leave us to go get it. The remaining customers on Univision still like Univision, but not at the level that the customers have left. So that makes it really hard to put Humpty Dumpty back to, together again. Even though the relationship, I think, is I think that, but not for lack of trying on 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 both the Univision management's part, um, and and the Dish management's part. So HBO is not trying, Univision is trying, but they're difficult situations. What our direction of management is, is that that's not an excuse to go lose to to continue to lose subs, right? Um, with Univision, we have an advantage in the marketplace now that. Latino subs can get can save ten, twelve, fifteen dollars from Dish, and 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 we'll provide a local antenna uh, so they can get the program and save ten, twelve, fifteen dollars over over everybody else in the industry. Um, and uh, we have to take advantage of that uh, in some markets because we're the only provider, major provider, that's in that situation today. So we're going to have a cost advantage, and we can go out and start building our Latino base, uh, but based on that cost advantage. So. Um, there becomes there becomes a tail on it, and then we move forward. Thank you. And next, we'll move to Philip Kusick with J.P. Morgan. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. I need you to get that 5G network up in the air. Um, Charlie, can you talk about timing on the IoT build and the cash needs as we go through the year for that? And then second, what's the latest on timing of your 5G equipment? Assuming you had the money, when could you efficiently start building that network? Okay, and Tom may want to jump jump in on this, uh, and, and, but uh, nothing's really changed on the cost or the timing. The cost of our of our network is between five initial phase one build of narrowband IT network is somewhere between 500 million and a billion dollars uh, through 2020. Um, we continue to make progress uh, in building that network. Um, we intend, we, you know, our expectation is we're going to meet the deadlines. We know there's going to be a lot of obstacles in the way, but we intend to, to meet that, that deadline. CapEx will, will accelerate in 2019 from where it has been in the past. Um, and what was the other part of the question? 5G equipment. equipment. Oh, 5G equipment. The, 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 because we're a stand, our plan is to build a standalone ground floor up 5G network. In other words, the only other country that's doing that today is China. So if we really want to compete with China in 5G, in my opinion, you, you need a standalone uh, 5G network from scratch. You need the, and then set, more importantly, maybe you need the architecture that goes with it. So uh, if we want to compete with China, it's imperative that in the United States somebody builds that standalone network. That specification for 3GP standalone specification is not out at the earliest until the end of this year. And then it takes several months to get equipment from that. So I would imagine that sometime in, in a little bit over a year from now, we'll start to, to have equipment in, five, in standalone 5G that we can start uh, deploying uh, that equipment. And so today we're basically architecting that, architecting that network um, and putting the business plan together. So um, that will do, you know, through the, through the rest of this year. And then, and then, you know, we will have, you know, a, a, a business plan for a, a network like you may only see in China, and and you know, our, how have you, we believe how we, have, and we believe we, we believe that with American ingenuity and other people, help, you know, we can build a network that can that can rival that or be better than that. Has there been any change in the the discussions with potential partners to help fund that, positive or negative? Um, we haven't had. I, I don't know. If we've had any negative discussions. We 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 certainly 
like like everybody else. People, I'd say it this way: people people are very interested. Those people are very knowledgeable, so perhaps more knowledgeable than than an analyst can be because they're in the business, or they build product for it, or they or they've studied the architecture for a long time. Uh, I think they're pretty. I think they're pretty positive, and I think that the 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 real 5G and the architecture that goes with it. When you put those two things together, I think most people. For virtually any business or, or any business in the United States, realize that that, that can be powerful uh, compared to what they get today in a in a wireless uh, network. And so, um, we've had discussions from people. We've had interest and in, in discussions for from un, unexpected places. But our strategy really is where somebody has infrastructure in place, or they do things that they do a good job at it. We're 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 going to try to partner with them. We may just be we, they just may be a vendor for us. We may just pay them. Right, there could be other things that happen there, but rather than try to reinvent it ourselves, set an example, we're not probably going to build towers. We're probably not going to lay a bunch of fiber if somebody's already got fiber. If some, when we need edge edge compute, if somebody's in the edge compute business, that's probably not a business we have to enter. Uh, if some, somebody doesn't do it or doesn't have confidence in us, then by all means we will do it. And, uh, very similar to uh, we launched our satellites in the DBS business. Some vendors uh, refuse to. Uh, launch for us because then they didn't think we could pay them. Some people refused to, build, refused to build satellites for us because they didn't think we could pay them or we'd be successful. But some people did believe we had a chance to be successful, and those people have become long-term vendors for, and partners for us for a long time. And I think the same thing's going to happen here. Uh, some people will, will be skeptical, as many people in life are, and some people will look at our track record and our commitment. Um, and, I, and our business plan, and they'll be opportunistic. Are you any more willing to borrow money against the spectrum to raise that 5G money than you were before? Well, we know it's going to we know it's going to cost us in the, in, in the magnitude of 10 billion dollars, and, and we're going to raise capital. I think that capital will, will come in, a, in, in. I think that capital will come from 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 in various different capital structures and sources. But I don't think I don't think we're Thanks, we're definitive on where. Thanks, Charlie. And next, we'll move to Mike McCormick with Guggenheim Partners. Hey, guys, thanks. Uh, Charlie, maybe just a, a quick comment on what you're hearing from uh, Washington with respect to your narrowband IoT build. Uh, when will we get comfort that that's going to meet their desires or needs? Um, and then with respect to Sling, just maybe a comment on the competitive landscape there, whether or not you were share takers from uh, DirecTV Now losses and the impact of Hulu Live and uh, YouTube TV. Thanks. All right, Warren, why don't you take that first part first? Okay, sure. I mean, um, it's, I think it's probably fairly well known that uh, DirecTV was uh, heavily promoting that product. Um, and so, you know, we just follow our, A, we listen to the customer, and B, we follow our sort of guidance internally of fiscal responsibility. So I don't know if we look at it as uh, taking share as much as we do. We just keep marching in the direction that works for us. I think Eric mentioned, um, you know, margin positive. Um, and we continue to accumulate customers, and frankly, I'm not exactly sure where they come from, but it's a good story for us. Yeah, in Washington, we don't, you know, I, I don't, we haven't heard, you know, obviously we got, we got, we have met with staff and the commissioners. We got questions, follow-up questions on that. We've answered those, those follow-up questions. We haven't, to my knowledge, have not heard anything since that period of time. Um, and obviously, we're, we're past the point of no return at this point to do something different. Um, I don't think there should be any any skepticism about narrowband IT or narrowband IoT build out meeting our our commitment uh, for, for the FCC because I think the rules are pretty clear uh, uh, in terms of uh, flexible use and it's pretty clear that that the incumbents all have have followed our lead with narrowband IT in the United States and of course other people are are doing that around the world. I don't think uh, I don't think we're happy. Um, that um, our network is not going to be uh, as robust as, as uh, perhaps some existing networks because we're limited by five megahertz of nationwide spectrum uplink spectrum. So we only have that cleared. The rest of, of spectrum is either tied up in the uh, in um, uh, interference studies by the government and, and from the auctions and, and also uh, tied up in, in uh, the DE uh, uh, Stuff that's going on at the FCC, where, they have, where all the information is in, but the FCC hasn't ruled yet, and 
So that's um, it's, it's more difficult to to, to plan uh, for something that we don't control at this point. So in addition to the 600, in, in addition to the 600, which isn't going to be cleared until June, and and there's always the risk that that broadcasters will ask for more time there. So so we obviously if we had if we had uh, ability to use the spectrum that we that we own and also work with their DR, DE partners in a more robust way, we could we could build a, a more robust network. So that's why. So we're all disappointed that that we that we can't do you know a little bit more. And I sure I'm sure that um, uh, given the given the kind of race to 5G and and the, and the the uh, I think within the Congress and the FCC and at, at Dish and also the incumbent operators, we we want to we want this country to lead in 5G. And I think we're going to play a big part in that. Great. Thanks, guys. And next, move to Jonathan Chaplin with New Street Research. Uh, thanks. A quick one for, uh, for Mr. Ergen. So a lot of the comments you've made about the 5G network that you're planning in phase two um, has echoes, at least for me, um, of what we saw GEO do with 4G in India. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent you've looked at that example and some of the experience of the disruption that GEO brought to India um, you think could be, could be replicated here. Um, and then just following on from Bill's question, um, in, in looking for a partner, um, are your discussions primarily with strategic and financial players in the U.S.? Um, or could international um, uh, players come into into this as a as a partner as well? Thanks. Hey, Jonathan, this is Tom. Uh, yes, we of course have looked at Geo, and uh, they've graciously spent some time with us and to help us better understand how they approach the market. It's pretty well documented how disruptive they were in terms of elimination of many carriers and uh, forcing prices and competition to respond. Um, you know, there's obviously differences between 4G and 5G, and as mentioned earlier on the call, er, you know, I think everyone in the industry understands that 3GPP has yet to finalize the Release 16 uh, documentation or codification of the standard, which really in Release 16 is, are the three pillar elements of 5G, which is enhanced mobile broadband, ultra-low latency and uh, massive connectivity. So once that gets finalized late this year or early next, then the ecosystem begins to develop. What we're also excited about is what's happening around virtualization and the opening of interfaces um, within radio access networks, which we think will have a significant impact on capital and operating expense in a network in the 2021 timeframe. And of course, having a green field with a clean sheet of paper gives us an advantage because you won't be burdened by any legacy uh, previous generation equipment and architecture. Yeah, and this is Charlie. I just would add that 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 realize that what Geo did was was clean sheet of paper in 4G, very limited band. Uh, I think they had around 40 megahertz of, of of bandwidth to work, and they have, I think, by last count, they're somewhere in the 270, 280 million customers. Uh, on that network uh, after 18 months. So, uh, but but the most important thing I think that that, that we learned was was the how how important architecture is to the network and and the efficiencies that you get in both the capex and opex uh, situation um, and flexibility that you get in your network when you architect it correct, correct when you architect it. And spend your time on architecture, and then, and then, obviously, part of that architecture is the virtualization that, that Tom alluded to. That makes that, that that I'd say it this way: the I believe that 5G with the proper architecture, right, and a clean sheet of paper has has the ability to be uh, far more reaching than the marketplace understands today. I think T-Mobile understands that, which is why you know they don't want us to be in the business. But uh, I think the external when you're talking about 5G being um, 28 gig, gigahertz to a couple people in Sacramento, um, or 5G E being, well, I actually don't know what that is. Uh, 5G E <laughs> is something. Something Sprint thinks that's illegal, and and AT&T thinks that's something the American public is going to 
is going to latch on to it. I don't know what that is, but what we're doing is different than that. That's all I'd say. And I think that as 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 we get farther into this, that would become more evident. And it's starting to become evident, obviously, to people that have spent time with us and, and really, really spend time in this industry. And Charlie, and with the, the work you're doing on... Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, just the, with the work you're doing with vendors on virtualization, could that result in a network that costs less than $10 billion to build? Or is that $10 billion uh, uh, still stand? It, it, the, we've seen estimates for less than that, um, and we've seen estimates for more than that. So I think <laughs> I, one of the – you know, I think, I think in, in taking on big projects, I think it's imperative that the strategic manager of our company, which is our board and, and, and our executive staff, that we set out those, those challenges. They need to be realistic, but they need to be – they need to be um, – um, they need they need to be realistic and achievable, but they need to, but they need to be a stretch too. And so I think that 10 billion gives you a feel for what we really think we're going to do. I hope you know we said 500 to a billion dollars on our initial phase. I hope we come. I hope I don't know where we're going to end up, but I hope I hope we come in look closer to 500 million than a billion. But I don't know. And 10 billion, I think we're going to be in that range. Uh, could be a little higher. Could be a little lower. And are you ready to move to your next question? Yes. Yes. Jason Baysnet with City. You know, I guess um, a couple of years ago we were we were pretty confident you weren't going to get an adverse ruling from the FCC on the DE discount issue, and we were wrong. And I just wonder if you could spend a second and talk about what happens mechanically if the FCC does sort of rule that your network doesn't meet the build-out requirements. Not, not so much, what, I'm just saying, let's posit that that's true. What are sort of the next steps that happen? Well, I, I guess I'd like preface that, that, that that's not going to happen, uh, but obviously to the extent you, like anything else, if you thought if in life, if you think you're right, you then, you go through the regulatory process, that, which could include up litigation, so both on the DE side, when, when they ruled against the DE structure, uh, by the way, properly, the, the court agreed with them. Um, it, it resulted in litigation, but the court also said that, that the FCC erred in not giving, as they had every other DE, and continue to give DEs the right to restructure to meet the DE. And, and you know, I'm proud of what the, the DEs did and what DISH did in restructuring and taking those 36 things that the FCC had concerns about and restructuring all those 36 things. So now that you know the the if the FCC is serious about getting spectrum put to use, right? We would expect that the FCC would 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 at least rule on the on the current application in front of them, right? At least rule on it so we can get move the process down the road. Now, obviously, we'd like to have them rule in our in our, our favor and the DE's favor, uh, but to the extent that there's still issues, we would certainly like to know it sooner rather than later. And so as, as this winds its, let's assume that they, they rule against you and it winds its way through court, you, can, you would continue to just sort of build out your network as if you're ultimately going to win in court. That's sort of the plan if we go down well, that route. We're, we're, we're going to build, yeah, we're going to, continue, we're going to continue on the IoT network and the 5G network. And again, we don't believe that's going to, we don't believe that's going to come to, to uh, a court. I think that's been, again, I, I, one analyst said there's no way we were building towers. One analyst said there's no way that narrowband IoT, even T-Mobile, who's been a, a big uh, uh, um, a, uh, adversary to, uh, in terms of getting us market, now, I think actually now admits in the filing that narrowband IT does meet uh, require does meet uh, uh, an obligation. So I don't put words in what they said, but that was the gist mm -hmm. of it. So I don't mm -hmm. think it. I, I just think that's a bit. I think that's a bit overblown, and, and uh, I think I don't think that. I, look, we have to execute. I mean, I don't think I think we we're coming we are coming under a, a, di a different level of scrutiny than probably any other wireless provider has. Um, but but having said that, I don't believe that the FCC is is looking to change the rule on flexible use. Uh, a, I don't think they can do it, 
legally, but I don't think they're looking to do that. I think, that, and, and I think that as they understand more, and this is up to us, right? This, this some of this is our fault, but as they understand more about what we're doing, and as they start understanding what the rest of the world's doing and what we're doing, and they understand the 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 need to lead in 5G and what a standalone network does that the other guys can't do. Uh, maybe I'm Pollyanna, but I, I think that, that the FCC, for the most part, will be supportive of that. And I think they'll be very supportive of that. Very helpful. Thank you. Because they're because they are. This is a, this is a great FCC for being supportive of, of trying to get uh, wireless assets used uh, a, a better and, and to, to advance the technology and lead the world in 5G. They are, they are to a person on the FCC and staff. You know, they are very focused on that, and I think they've done. Just a simple example and very, you know, kind of controversial, but uh, <clears throat> they did <clears throat> pass regulations for, for or improve regulations or lack of regulation for small cell. That that wasn't easy politically, and that wasn't. It's maybe not a popular decision, but that's important if we're going to lead in 5G. And, and and they did this. FCC did that, and so they do a lot of good things. Thank you. And next, the move to Vijay Giant with. Evercore ISI. So Jay, your line is open. You can move on. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Walter Peak with P B T I G. Thanks. Uh Charlie, two questions. First on CapEx, I think you were you've already started putting some radios on towers in 2018 that there was capex was imperceptible i guess it just seemed like a normal run rate um, if you think about 2019 when would the bulk of of capex hit and then the second question is um, you know the sprint t-mobile deal looks like it's coming uh, to its final stages here if the government blocks it um, and you have an opportunity to partner with one of those companies which would be preferable i mean i would, I would think that you know, Masa and Sprint might be a little bit more desperate for a solution for Sprint, but on the other side, you know, T-Mobile has probably a greater need for mid-band spectrum. They got better scale. They can generate free cash flow and help to fund the build. So, which of those, which of those two partners would would you find more attractive if they were both an option to you for the 5G build? Thanks. Hey, Walt. It's Tom. I'll take the first one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as you know, to in order to hang. Radios on towers, there's many steps that, that you have to go through in terms of milestones before you can proceed to construction. So much of that is moving through the pipeline uh, in late fourth quarter and early first quarter. We've also had some pretty significant weather issues in some parts of the country. So to answer your question, I would expect um, second and third quarter to ramp activity pretty significantly in terms of tower activity and therefore the associated CapEx. And then you know, I, I mean, it's no. I mean, this is public. We tried to buy Sprint, so <laughs> right. And obviously, we're continued discussions with them prior to their uh, merger uh, with uh, with Demo. So, you know, the the we'll have to wait and see what the what the regulators you decide. You know, you know, I think <clears throat> Sprint and Demo have done a pretty good job on the on the political side of their. Their merger, and you know, <clears throat> I think we're sympathetic to <clears throat> some of the things <clears throat> that they're saying, you know. But they've they've done a really poor job on the on the antitrust side, uh, you know, through three economic studies. They, <clears throat> their own economic studies, they've showed the prices would go up, and 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 obviously they would they would uh, become the biggest hoarder of spectrum in the, with three, by going over the market the, by the the, uh, the the limits that the FCC is. The screen, screening limit. So, but you know, 300. We're really almost two and a half times more spectrum than the other people. So that, you know, I think they've got they've got they've got challenges there. But um, let's 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 see where that ends up. And then, regardless of where that ends up, it, it, at, from a dish perspective, you know, we want to we want a chance to compete. And Charlie, if I could just follow up, we might fail. Uh, we might Frank. fail. We might fail. But we want a chance to compete. It's Rich Greenfield. Just Sorry, real go quick. ahead, Walt. No, no, it's Rich um, Greenfield. Um, 
when you had said on the in the release that or in your comments before that roughly ha a little bit more than half of your 381,000 subscriber losses were due to your programming issues. So I'm just going to round and say roughly 200,000. But I think you have been pretty clear, on, not just on this call, but prior calls, that most of the Univision pain was felt in those first couple of months after the drop in, in, in late June, early July. D does that mean that HBO or the, the loss of HBO contributed the majority of that 200,000 subscriber loss? Because it, it sort of surprises me with HBO so available on Amazon Prime and HBO Now, which you can buy on broadband, like it just seems surprising to me that HBO would have that much of an impact when there's lots of ways to get HBO. So maybe you could just clear that up for us. Yeah, I don't think I can clear it up for you, but I think as Eric said in his comments, the, the, with Univision, there was, an, there was uh, Univision per se went down in June, but Univision Deportes, which is their sports network, and all the, the soccer uh, went down at the end of October. So there was what I would, you know, I, I don't have numbers in front, but my guess is that, that the, obviously Univision had a pretty dramatic drop through the summer and then maybe started leveling off. And then, and then when the soccer fans lost soccer, they, they probably another drop there. And HBO, um, I think that it, 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 HBO will be interesting because as you say, people find another way to get it. And HBO, uh, at least HBO hasn't had uh, any real new shows uh, come, you know, they're, they're, let me put it this way, their, their main claim to fame today from a show is, is uh, Game of Thrones, and that hasn't been on uh, during the period that our new shows haven't been on during the period that they've been down. So I think that realistically you would expect that when Game of Thrones comes on, you may see uh, a pickup in, in defections uh, from HBO. But the losses are, the losses are, for both takedowns, we have certainly have losses, and we would have preferred not to have takedowns because it's always painful for our customers, and when it's painful for our customers, it's painful for us. Do you want to add something to that, Eric? No, I think you covered it, Rich. I mean, uh, Charlie and, and, and Rich, I mean, roughly half, I mean, your, your math works there, so. Thanks very much. I think, I think the thing for analysts on the call is the underlying business is, is actually, I think the steps that Eric and team have taken over the last couple of years, the painful steps of, of, of right-sizing our customers, of, of of, of, of eliminating customers that aren't profitable, which we had some, of, 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 of not doing crazy uh, giveaways and, and, and just trying to have numbers for the street, but rather run it as a business and, and run it uh, for the long-term profitability of that business. You know, I think, is, I think the, the core business, that's paying big dividends. I think, I think, I think AT&T, to their credit, is probably going through that similar process now and so they'll have a few quarters where they have to right size that uh, because they were very aggressive on some of their promotions that just couldn't possibly be making money um, and you know at some point you have you know at some point there's a race to the bottom until people realize they're at the bottom and then people start climbing their way back up and I think I think we're I think we're kind of there you know we're already past that for the most part, and I think I think others in the industry will get there, and you'll see some stabilization as a result once that happens. Thank you. And next, we'll move to Marcy Rivicker with Wolf Research. I have a couple questions. The first, you know, the ecosystem is clearly changing, and it feels like it's just going to get harder for the core business to continue to run. So. I guess, why doesn't it make sense at this point to do a JV with AT&T and share costs? Well, it's pretty simple. If, you're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're sticking a gun to your head and taking HBO, taking HBO away, you're probably not having a lot of conversations. I mean, I, last I looked, HBO is owned by AT&T. Kind of, you can't. You can't. <clears throat> we're, not, we're not real good at guns at our head. And then I want to ask a question on the core business. So without HBO and Univision, um, is it safe to assume that programming expense in 2019 should be lower than 2018? It will be lower. Well, there's price increases, so you got to balance those two out. Uh, but they will be definitely lower than they otherwise would have been. Those are certainly those are certainly two of the products that, you know, objectively based on viewer measurement, might be considered overpriced. 
Go ahead, Paul. Got it. Yeah. And uh, then third. Okay. On a per subscriber basis, you'll see uh, increases in programming costs, even in spite of uh, HBO and Univision being down. Okay. Just because locals and other ones have such high increases in them. And then third thing, there's been some conversation, Charlie, that either you or Dish or both are backing lowcast.org. So do you have any comments on that? No. Thank you. Operator, we'll take one more from the analyst community and then move to media. Thank you. We will now take our final question from the analyst community. <laughs> Members of the media on the call, please press star 1 now to enter the queue to ask a question. We will begin that, the media portion of this call following the answer to this final analyst question. Our final quest, analyst question comes from Gregory Williams with Cowan & Company. Great. Thanks for squeezing me in. Um, my question is on G&A. It was up um, fourth quarter. Uh, I get the seasonal aspects to it, but it's up fourth quarter, seven million over fourth quarter last year. And just wondering if there's anything specific to call out. And then changing gears, just want to talk a little bit about Spectrum. Um, in the last quarter or since last um, earnings, the C-band and CBRS um, spectrum band developments have been occurring, and um, for one C-band, it looks like that we can see as much as 300 megahertz to market, higher than the 200 that was proposed. And just want to know or just be interested in your take on these developments and uh, spectrum in general as it relates to your portfolio. Thanks. Yeah, this is Paul. I'll take the uh, GNA question. Uh, there's just some small puts and takes there. There's, there's nothing really to call out on uh, that increase. And I think I think it relates to spectrum. I think that trying to get more spectrum uh, available either for satellite or for crystal or some combination uh, is some, is worthwhile endeavors. And, and I think CBRS is you know C bands a little bit is, is a little bit tougher. CBRS seems to be moving along and the and the rules are like kind of out and looks like that's going to proceed. C band the C band stuff's a little tougher because basically have four four non-U.S. companies, European and Canadian companies that can, that control that spectrum, and you kind of can't, you know, the any, normally you'd have, you know, you'd have an auction process where the government would share in any proceeds, that's similar to what maybe the incentive auction. So I think that that's the, nor the normal kind of process there, at least in the modern era. But but that's a bit more difficult in this situation. So on that hand. You know, I think politically windfalls to foreign companies that might not be paying U.S. taxes on it, you know, might be, might be you know, or have tax treaties and, and, and you know, might be might be interesting. And then the effect on CBRS from an interference perspective are things that people have to look at. But in general, we'd be supportive of both C CBRS and C-band additions to the marketplace as long as that's done in a, you know, a manner that's fair and equitable to, to both incumbents and new entrants and to the U.S. Treasury. Got it. Thank you. We will now take questions from the members of the media. Again, if you're a member of the media and would like to ask questions, please press star 1 now to enter the queue to ask a question. Our first media question comes from Sheila Dang with Reuters. For taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, whether you have any um, more programming contracts that are up for renewal this year. Um, you know, do, do you expect to have um, conversations with anyone else coming up? Uh, yeah, this Char this Charlie, we, we have, uh, I'd say a couple things. One is we always have programming contracts coming up. Um, uh, so that every year, that's that's that that will be no different. I will say that the, the one of the things that in the in the uh, in the uh, AT&T merger with Time Time Warner that was a positive was that they agreed to uh, uh, baseball style binding, binding arbitration, or they offered everyone baseball style type arbitration. So you know that so you, you know that's a that's a process where where if somebody chose to get into that process or go through that process, those those signals would not go would not be subject to going down if those contracts are up. Okay, thank you. And we'll next move to Scott Moritz with Bloomberg. 
Great, thanks. Um, Charlie, you were pretty accurate with your prediction about HBO uh, impacting um, the subscriber levels. Uh, and as you look ahead, um, you're already predicting that probably Game of Thrones contributes to more subscriber losses. Just curious if, and to follow Sheila's question, are there more contracts uh, that might be significant coming up that you can point to? And is there a sense that uh, there's a scent of blood in the, in the water that maybe you, you, you might not have the, the leverage in negotiations with future contracts? Well, we've never had we've never had any leverage, so I don't think that's changed. We're we're a little pipsqueak in a world of of, of really big companies, so we've never we've never had any, any leverage. Um, but we do write big checks to programmers, and and we have real data. I mean, we approach it differently, right? We look at real data about what our customer views and how they, you know, and that that you know real data and what they view and what the cost per viewing hour is a bunch along with a bunch of other data. And so we have a relative basis for what people watch and what they're willing to pay. Then you also look at what the alternatives to get that product, right? So HBO obviously today is, is available from AT&T Direct so you can get it, you know, a variety of different ways. So, and then we, you know, we have a feel for what it is. Most, most, most programmers, at least historically have said, we have a budget to make. We got this, we got this much last year. Um, we want to we want an increase. We want a five, ten percent, fifteen, depending on what if it's local TV. It might be more than that. An increase, and we have to make their rationale is they got to make their budget. They have to increase. But even the even the CEO of, of AT and T said, you know, in a world of declining ratings, you know, six, seven, eight percent increases are not sustainable. I think we figured that out a few years ago that that's that that's not sustainable. So. Look, we're, we we love the partners that we've had. They've helped us grow our business. I think we've done a good job of helping them grow their businesses. Where somebody wants to to work with us, we'll do our darndest to to get subscribers and make sure our product's good and our signal's good. And and if somebody doesn't want to work with us, you know, we life will move on, and we're going to figure out how to run this company profitable. And and there's ways to do that. But I. Again, I, I, I think HBO is a unique situation because of the AT&T acquisition of Time Warner. And Univision was, was a little bit unique because there was a, a management change both at the, C, at the executive level and also in the, all their programming departments. So there was nobody there that had the history uh, other than a budgetary item in front of them that the, that the previous company, team had. So, they, you know, we got off to a slow start, let's put it that way. A little bit, a little bit of miscommunication. Thanks. And next, but, you know, I, look, I, I think you look at history. By the way, I, I think you can look at history. We've probably done ten thousand. I mean, I'll say a thousand deals. We've probably had, you know, a very small percentage of those ever lead to a takedown. And I think, uh, in terms of permanent, and very, and just a handful have been permanent losses. But if something's unrealistic, and and it, if you can. Make more money and service your customer better by taking something down. By all means, I think you should do it. There's no, there's no, there's no certainty in this business. And next, move to Dave Hayes with Deadline. Thanks so much. Um, there's so much investment on the content side and direct-to-consumer offerings. Um, both uh, of the companies you're uh, in disputes with have those. And in, in HBO's case, they've taken pains to describe HBO now as a complement. Um, you know, it's neutral in terms of their core business. They're trying to do it collaboratively. But as you step back and kind of look at its evolution over these last couple of years, um, as well as, you know, other partners and other, other programmers, I mean, isn't it an irritant? How, how would you view the direct-to-consumer business I mean, hasn't it made life more complicated? I'd just be interested in any any thoughts there. Well, I, I, first of all, I take issue that HBO is collaborative. I think I think they clearly are going. To, I think they clearly are going into competition with the distributors. If they're, I mean, they do two things. So AT&T sells it for free, right, in a bundle. So it's actually free for life, right? Or it has been in the past, and and of course they sell it direct. So that's not very collaborative with people that have helped build their business over the years. But I, but having said that. 
you know, that, if that's where the world's going is management, you have to make decisions based on where th things are going. Um, so yes, a direct to, to consumer business is, 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 and that's why we started Sling. It's why we moved into connectivity, transitioned to connectivity, because we saw those kind of things happen years, years, maybe years before most people saw those things. The other piece of it is that, that Eric and team, you know, the, the, the business is, is not going away. There are, there, there, we have real strengths. There are people in rural America that going to customer direct is not possible today. They don't have a fast enough uh, broadband connection to do that. There are people that love the fact that the viewing experience on, a, on an addition network system with the hopper, with primetime anything, and ability to, to skip through uh, commercials with the ability to record uh, a thousand hours of programming to never miss your show, the ability to get a second subscription for free uh, with, the, with Sling, and to watch your TV, TV on any device and uh, 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 anywhere you are. The fact that we have a, a, a voice remote uh, where you don't, where you now you can discover a program in a different way. That, that's a pretty popular product with a lot of people. And I'm pretty omniscient about what's out there, and I still love my hopper, and I ain't changing, right? Because I, because that viewing experience is far superior to what, whatever. And I, and I can get broadband. I do have high speed broadband. So, second thing is there's places, places where, where our competition can't go. If you want to, if you're a truck or an RV or a tailgater at a game, Right, you can't you can't go there with with. Uh, have you ever tried at a game to get wife to get a, a connection for stream video? It just doesn't happen. You you know. So we have unique unique areas of our our business that 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 our that our team can focus on and grow those sides of the business. So so a, absent HBO and Univision, I think I think you'd see this company in a little bit different light. And we're not. I'd say maybe we're not as pessimistic as the tone of the analysts on this call it, it, to our core business. I don't, Eric, you want to add anything to that? Okay. Since we talk about it literally every day. Yeah. <laughs> Operator, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll take one more call from the uh, media community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Andrew Dotson with Denver Business Journal. Thanks, uh, Charlie. You guys did some testing on the ATSC 3.0 standard that broadcasters are working to launch. I think it was last spring. Um, I'm just curious what has you excited about that standard and how could DISH leverage it as we're you mentioned earlier, you know, you're putting up antennas to help people get Univision during this blackout. Um, is this could it, is it something different? Does it have you more excited about it? Well, it, 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 the way I would say it is, ATS 3.0 is a new broadcasting standard. And when I, I don't know if you were on earlier, but when I, we talk about we don't want to build infrastructure where we don't have to, and the broadcasting community, uh, particularly the independent broadcasters, they have a whole set of you know, what are they going to do long term, you know, in terms of growing their business? What's the, what's the shift they need to? So ATS 3.0 is a new opportunity from a broadcast perspective where we think there might be good partnerships between broadcasters and us in the sense that they can use that technology to broadcast uh, and different revenue stream from them that we probably wouldn't participate in. But we also can be the gap filler for them since we're going to be having towers in, 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 in more rural communities and along highways for autonomous vehicle, for vehicles and things like that. In addition, we have uplink spectrum that they don't have from a broadcast side. When you put those things together, that looks to me like a potentially interesting uh, match of technology. So we're testing, we're, we continue to test. Um, we're going to do even more tests, and we continue to work with, with, with broadcasters to see whether you know, where they want to go with that. And, you know, look, at this point, we're in the early inning. We're in the first inning of ATS 3.0. I, I, I don't think anybody knows exactly where that can go. But we our, our nose, you know, I, I would just say that we normally see technologies. We're not always right. But we have a pretty good track record of identifying technologies and, and staying focused on them for a long period of time until they come to, to fruition. Um, and ATS 3.0 has that potential, but um, we don't know where it leads. We'll continue to monitor and test it. Thank you. Operator, that's it for us today. Thank you all for participating. And that will conclude today's call. We thank you for your participation.